other questions? Back here. Yeah. Two-part question, John. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm from Ohio. Uh, John, first question related to your new efforts uh, toward uh, doing another program. Uh, when will that be coming out? And secondly, last year in Cynthia, everybody noticed that in the mainstream media there was absolutely uh, nothing that came out uh, with respect to our side of the story. Is, is there any resource that our side has who by virtue of their their wealth or, or some other uh, attribute could somehow get time purchase on a national network scale to to uh, play some of these these important things like the, the thing we just launched the last person who tried to do something meaningful for the country by buying time on television to change the course of America was Ross Perot. And he spent millions of dollars running for president against Clinton and Bush. And I remember those shows, those half-hour shows, like the half-hour that Garrison got, he'd get out a blackboard and he'd have Bush's name on one side and Clinton's name on the other side and he'd write like NAFTA in the middle. He says, if either one of these guys become president, NAFTA is going to be passed, and it's going to be gone. Well, he's the one that created the election success for Clinton because he took so many votes away from Bush, but he backed up because of threats against his, his daughter and against his family. And there, he might have pulled a real upset if he'd stayed in. There is no way, no way you can buy that time. When I was... Uh, major success in television in the 70s, there were, the, the law was that if you were a corporation, you could not own more than seven television stations around the country. And you couldn't have a newspaper and a television station in the same city. But you know who got rid of all that? Clinton. Guess who got rid of, signed NAFTA? Clinton. And guess who repealed Glass-Steagall? Glass-Steagall was passed under the Roosevelt to save capitalism from the socialist re revolution, which would prevent the banks from doing what the banks did in 2008 that t cost me a $900,000 home and a $200,000 pension plan. And I'm not alone. I'm not alone. That's Bill Clinton. And guess what else Bill Clinton did? He murdered 87 women and children in Waco, more than half of them black, and not a word from that guy that's on M MSNBC and Jesse Jackson. As a matter of fact, after the trial, successful trial of the King family in proving the government and the FBI killed Martin Luther King, you can now Google Dick Gregory going around to college campuses and getting $20,000 showing footage at the trial proving that Jesse Jackson helped set up the murder of Martin Luther King. I've seen it in a half a dozen cities and Jesse has yet to file a lawsuit for libel against that. These are stories that you will never ever see. Thank God for the internet. And that's from an atheist, okay? Thank God for the internet. But what they're trying to do now is they're trying to regulate the internet. And if they do that, democracy is totally gone. As a matter of fact, earlier this year, 12 social scientists from the big university said we are no longer a democracy, we're an oligarchy. The truth is we're corporatocracy, where the Supreme Court says that corporations are people. Well, if corporations are people, like we people, we individuals who commit a crime, we should go to jail. Right now, the president, that woman who runs General Motors, should be in prison for homicide, negligent homicide, because they knew their cars were defective and would kill people. But it's easier to give a million dollars to a surviving family than to recall all that stuff and fix it again. It is not the USA anymore. It's the CIA. You know, when I was struggling to come into this country to be a citizen, I tried to join the American Air Force. I was 16. 
But I had a lot of, I was like an Oliver Twist kid. I had a lot of problems with the law when I was a kid. But I found out if I could get, if I could become a citizen, join the service, in five years, I could be a citizen. And I was really looking forward to that. But they didn't let me take the final exam. You have been dumbed down so far as a country for one reason, to support the military machinery fighting ghosts. I know five bright young boys, 22 and 23, who cannot get a job. You know what they're going to do? They're going to join the United States military in the hope that they live long enough to get a free college education. And you know how bad it's gotten now? They're looking for so much cannon fodder. If you cannot speak English and you sneak across the border and join the army, you're a citizen the day you join the army. All of this is deliberate. It is absolutely no accident. What they did in 1968, the citizens of the United States, the reason they dumbed you down is there's no draft. I mean, during the Vietnam War, it was the middle class protesting. It wasn't the poor folks. Because wealthy mothers and fathers, I mean, some of them like George Bush could run off, or Clinton could run off. But lots of them had to go to Vietnam, and they didn't want to go. So they had to figure a way to dumb it down. You know, I guarantee you right now that if you stop five recent graduates from any major university and give them a literacy test from a high school from 1970s, they will fail it. They want businesses out of the country, want you dumb enough to need a job so you can become cannon fodder for the 1%. Gosh, another question. <laughs> so I give it to Jim. Yes, ma'am. she's referring to is Executive Order 1111, which called for the United States Treasury under uh, John Kennedy to print silver certificates. At the time, interest rates, Federal Reserve is owned by six private banks. They finance the United States of America well. Kennedy wanted to get rid of that, so he signed Executive Order 1111, which called for the printing of silver certificates if you were, a, a, let's say you were hit by a hurricane and you're a farmer and you need to borrow $10,000, instead of paying 20% to the Federal Reserve, you pay 1.5% to the federal government. That fund becomes available to any citizen of the United States. That would have put the Federal Reserve out of business. The day he was shot, I have some of the silver certificates. The day he was shot, the printing presses stopped. Mm -hmm. That's true. And by the way, the, uh, the uh, Kennedy's order authorizing uh, uh, $4.2 billion in uh, red ink treasury notes, silver backed uh, treasury notes, uh, and to the best of my knowledge, was never officially rescinded. No, it's not. It's, it, they just quit doing it. <laughs> and we were back to Federal Reserve notes. And the difference is, is that we have to pay interest on Federal Reserve notes. But just to point out, though, to add to this, is that it wasn't just this order. Uh, Kennedy's uh, Secretary of the Treasury was uh, altering regulations trying to restore more power away from the Federal Reserve System and back into state and, uh, and local banks. You wanted to follow up on that, Miss? Right. So we failed back then because of the assassination. But I really think instead of marching, we're going to have strange paradigm shifts like Bitcoin, which I think could literally they're losing their ability to follow money with Bitcoin and that's where their power is. So even though we want to march, which is people have been marching for years and marching and get nowhere, if we actually change the paradigm of what we're doing on a daily basis with our money, we can literally take these people down. You know, I, 
I consider myself quite knowledgeable about a lot of things, but for the life of me, no matter how much I read about Bitcoin, and I was an honor student, I do not understand it. And then if you don't understand it, how can you simplify it enough? And do you have access to the media to get the information out about Bitcoin? It's easier to reveal if Ron Paul had been successful in getting an audit of the Fed, it would have been easier to reveal that to the public than to educate them about Bitcoin. <laughs> you may, you may okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. Going back to the NSA comment you made earlier, it's just a coincidental thing. Uh, last night I met a gentleman who uh, work, said he works for Siemens, and he uh, was involved or at the tail end of the uh, finalization of that NSA building project, and he had uh, commented that how complex the electrical system is of that uh, building. And he made a comment that the, if the United States basically lost its entire power infrastructure, that building will remain fully powered for years. But that they have the sustainability to withstand every disaster known to man. So that's just an interesting coincidence that happened to me last night. But um, so that's where our money's going. Yeah, anyway. That shows that they are building all this redundancy in there. And yeah. here's what this means for you folks. Okay, the, 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 somebody sets off an EMP pulse, everything goes dark, you got no electricity, you got nothing, uh, social services fall apart, police are, are in fire, not operating. All right, sounds like the zombie apocalypse. Uh, and yet, somebody's gonna show up at your door and want your rent or your mortgage payment because they're gonna have these records still stored away somewhere. You'll never question. get away from them. I do have a question. Uh, so the, uh, the E. Howard Hunt tapes came out a while back uh, where he was on his deathbed basically admitting to his role in the assassination. Um, do you, A, believe that he was being honest and truthful and exposing his involvement? No. Uh, and, and then secondly, do you believe his son was just trying to get information out for the public good? Yes. I uh, think his son, I've met with St. John Hunt and spent a lot of time with him and I think that he's on the level about what he says, and I think he's probably accurately reporting what E. Howard says, but E. Howard, his whole life was CIA and deception. And uh, of course, if you, if you uh, stop and think about it, he details what he said was the chain of command for the assassination, but then takes himself out of it and says, oh, well, I just heard about this and I, I didn't join in. So anyway, I think his, uh, his statements, while very interesting and, ought to be, and worth noting, uh, I would take with a grain of salt. Jim is absolutely right. He underplayed his role. He had a very significant role in the assassination, which was that of the bag man. There is a wonderful book out written by Mark Lane called Plausible Denial. There was a guy named Victor Marchetti who was with the CIA, wrote an article about E. Howard Hunt in a very conservative newspaper back east. Some say it was owned by a Nazi, but very conservative talking about E. Howard Hunt being involved with the assassination. And E. Howard Hunt, knowing how strong the CIA is, decides to sue Spotlight Magazine and Victor Marchetti. The trial takes place in Florida, and he lost the case. The jury concluded this man was involved with the assassination of John Kennedy. It was never, ever reported, but Mark's book is brilliant. It's the same as Codename Zorro. Codename Zorro was uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover's nickname for Martin Luther King, and you've now seen recently on the internet uh, Edgar Hoover's letter to Martin Luther King suggesting that there's only, only one way out, and that was to off himself. Well, when I was an award-winning media critic on NBC, I bought Codename Zorro because Dick Gregory had done the liner notes of my first album, I read the book and I was astounded. This is all information that came from the House Select Committee. And guess what? NBC says, you're not going on the air to review that trash. I said, what trash? And they said, these are conspiracy nuts. I said, hey, they're quoting the discoveries of the House Select Committee. They said, you're not going on the air. So they kicked me off the air. 
I went to my lawyer and I said, sue those sons of bitches at NBC. Tear that peacock to hell. And they said, what for? I said, well, they violated my First Amendment rights. And they said, my lawyers, who were very expensive, said, you don't have any. You're an employee. NBC has the First Amendment rights. If you want First Amendment rights, get your own newspaper and get your own television station. I was, I was fortunate enough, they had made the mistake of announcing that I was going to be on the air. But I wasn't. Now, I was responsible for 10% of the viewing audience of the news. So they said, well, we to bring John back. I came back and I, I did the review of Codename Zorro. And guess what? Not only is America still here, <laughs> it got worse. They have since retitled it Murder in Memphis. And it is a colossal, colossal book that should be read by every citizen of the United States about how they murdered Martin Luther King. Which goes to prove that our freedom of the press belongs to the guy that owns the press. That's exactly right. They believe in freedom of speech as long as you don't have too large a crowd like you wonderful folks. I would add this about E. Howard Hunt in talking with his son, St. John Hunt. One thing he told me that I, really sticks in my mind is that Hunt's defense in his libel suit in Florida was that he was home with his family on the weekend of the assassination. St. John Hunt, who was not that young, he was young, but I forget now, he was like maybe 12, 13, something like that. He said, no, he wasn't home that weekend. We all wondered about that. So he lied about that. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust anything he hired him and said. Um, More questions? Any other questions? Over here. Uh, Hi. Yes, um, ma'am. <laughs> thank you. So I am fascinated by reading anything I can get my hands on this, um, but it terrifies me every night. And I'm wondering, if I should continue to investigate, should I fear for my life? Should I fear no. for my life? No. Listen, I've been trying to do this for 44 years, and I don't have any protection whatsoever. I have no influence over anybody, but hopefully people will see Jim Garrison's story. And I, I've shown this to people who are really learned about the assassination and find out they learn something more every single time they look at this thing. There are facts in this film that they don't, don't ever fear for your life. Never, ever fear for your life. This gentleman back here with the glasses, glasses. yes, you sir. Uh, yes, I, I, have, I have tons of material. I couldn't include it all. Jim wanted to keep it straightforward. The thing I like about the documentary is, is it's a very straightforward. It tells the story. Of, it, it allows him to tell his story. But along the way, you get to know him. One of the things I have, I have photographs. He believed one of the shots came from the sewer in front. And I, because Clint Hill... The Secret Service said the first shot he heard was in echo. Only a, a sewer creates an echo. But he said, you don't put that in, it just complicates stuff. Keep it as simple as possible. And I have lots of stuff about Permandex inflation. And the truth is, and Jim can attest to this, the documents that have been released recently, thanks again to Oliver Stone's film, prove that Clay Shaw was an important asset of the CIA. If Jim Garrison had that, that information, he would have won the conviction, but he did say he won the perjury. And you know, if the federal government's after mafia people, they don't want to get them all for killings. They want to get them for perjury because they can put them away for 20 or 30 years for perjury. The perjury case against Clay Shaw is a slam dunk and the federal government then brought out the big guns and literally stopped the case at that point. If you want to read about the Permandex, uh, check out my uh, revised edition of Crossfire. Uh, okay, all right. And, and, oh, yeah. And I'll tell you what, also Google uh, Operation Gladio, G-L-A-D-I-O. This was the uh, pro program over in Europe to restore fascists uh, in power, and it was tied in with CIA anti-communist stuff. It, it all ties into that. Again, just further evidence that Clay Shaw was 
connected into intelligence work. I guess we should wrap this up, but again, I, I'm so profoundly grateful that you came out today. I really appreciate your being here. And hopefully next year on November 22nd, maybe we will meet at a theater in Washington, DC, uh, the Booth Theater. And uh, Ford Theater. Yeah, the Ford Theater. Uh, oh, <laughs> named it after the SF. Well, this is the Oswald Theater, right? Okay, and we will screen then the, uh, the second part to Jim Garrison's story again. Thank you all, a good life and a better America to all of you. Thank you. Change is at hand, and our task, our obligation, is to make that revolution, that change, peaceful and constructive for all. Those who do nothing are inviting shame as well as violence. Those who act boldly are recognizing right as well as reality.